It's a real pleasure for me to have the privilege of introducing Brother Robert Dodson to you. I realize that most all of you know Robert, and to know Robert is to love him. He's a, a wonderful, wonderful Christian man, a gentleman in every uh, way, and a great gospel preacher. Uh, I've known Robert now about 24 years, and I just esteem him so very highly. He has a wonderful, marvelous characteristic that I admire. He's an even-keeled person. Uh, Robert is always a, a Christian. He has a smile on his face and a good word to say, and, and I love to be around him. He is a native to this area. He was reared in Irving, Texas, which is not all that far away. And he's married to uh, Sherry, and she's a lovely lady. And I, is she with you today, Robert? She's working. <laughs> Somebody's got to work, you know. Uh, but she's working. But nonetheless, she is a lovely person in every way. He's a graduate of the Preston Road School of Preaching back in 1978. And he served the Lord's Church in Houston and Sansom Park here in Fort Worth and Haltom City. I think he was with the Birdville congregation well over 20 years and did an outstanding job there and is now working with the Northwest Congregation, and Spencer Ross is associated with him in that work, as I've already pointed out. He's participated in uh, mission campaigns in the country of Canada and Mexico and Jamaica and Africa and Singapore, so he's gotten around pretty much in those areas, and uh, we're delighted to have him. When Brother Eddie Parrish came into the elders not too long ago and informed us that he really needed a rest from, from the uh, responsibilities of the Truth and Love television program, and by the way, he's done an outstanding job. We really hated to hear uh, the fact that uh, uh, he was really wanting to sort of phase out of that, and uh, we commend him highly. He did a superb job all the time he was uh, conducting that television program. But nonetheless, when he wanted to uh, uh, be relieved of that responsibility, one of the first names that came up was Robert Dodson, who would be a good replacement for Eddie. And a unanimous decision was made by the elders that if we could get Robert to do that, uh, he would be the choice. And, and so he did accept that responsibility. The elders at Northwest have allowed him to do that, and we're grateful for their cooperation in the, in the matter. And so he will be the new host on the television program. And we're just so delighted to have him. He's going to be speaking to us on a subject that's dear to all of our hearts, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Robert, we're happy to have you with us today. Good morning. Brethren, it's a real joy to be with you. It's always a, a great pleasure to be a part of the Fort Worth Lectures and to be with you like this. And I've been looking forward to this uh, for some time now, actually. Uh, I love this congregation. I love the elders here. And, of course, Maxie has been a very dear friend of mine for, for many years. And I don't know if you realize, but the Brown Trail Congregation, you have uh, been a vital part of my preaching life for a long time, having preached in this area for so long and having such a close association with you, and of course teaching in the school for, for many years as well, and now uh, being able to be a part of the television program, The Truth in Love. I'm so uh, uh, humbled by being asked to do something like that, and I'm very excited about the opportunity, and I want you to know uh, how encouraging you have been to me. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your kind words, and I also want you to know how desperately I covet your prayers as we go forward uh, in this effort. I want to do everything that I can to uh, work together with you in uh, reaching lost souls for Jesus Christ, and we hope that everything will be done to the glory of God. Our assignment this morning, the resurrection of Jesus, is one of the first of all principles of the Bible. 
uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, you remember Paul in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, spoke of the gospel, which he said, by which we are saved. We're, we were saved by the gospel. We're going to be saved by the gospel, and we are being saved by the gospel. First of all, Paul said how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and was raised from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus are the first of all facts of the gospel. They are the most important. They are the most significant. They are vital and essential in every way to our salvation. The resurrection of Jesus then was what Jesus, or rather what the Apostle Paul began with when he uh, started writing the Roman letter. As he spoke of the divinity of Jesus Christ, as he spoke of him as the Son of God, he reminded us how that has been declared by the resurrection of the dead, Romans 1 verse 4. And we see the vital connection between the resurrection of Jesus and our salvation as a recurrent theme throughout this letter. In Romans chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, we see that he was raised for our justification. That is, we could not be made right with God were it not for the resurrection of Jesus. We see in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, how that is when we are identified with the resurrection of Jesus in our baptism, that we are raised to walk in newness of life. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, we are married to the one who has been raised. That is, we are spiritually united with Jesus Christ, so he says that we might bring forth fruit to God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, we find that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit that dwells in us and that gives life to our mortal bodies. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 tells us that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Certainly, we all can see the vital importance, the essentiality, uh, the significance of the resurrection of Jesus. So this is indeed one of those great lessons of the book. Uh, one that we must not ignore, that we must continue to emphasize in our preaching and in our teaching. This morning as we look at this lecture, my goal is to help us to strengthen our faith in the resurrection of Jesus. I assume that most all of us believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But we want to verify that fact. We want to confirm that fact. We want to remind you of that fact. Uh, we want to strengthen our faith in the resurrection of Jesus. In doing that then, we can uh, better experience the power of the resurrection. And we can know in a greater way the hope of the resurrection in our own personal lives. So let's begin this morning by considering the proof of the resurrection. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of Jesus' death. You see, there can be no resurrection without a death. And you need to realize, if you don't already, that there are a lot of folks who would say that Jesus never died. There are those who say that Jesus just fell into a deep sleep, that he went into some kind of coma, and then somehow or another later awakened from that coma. But let's consider the facts. Take a look at the last chapters of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And you'll see in the accounts of Jesus' suffering and death that he was not only crucified, but that he was also scourged by the Roman soldiers. And you remember, they were experts in, in cruelty and torture. And we can only imagine what it must have been like for Jesus to have experienced the scourging at the hands of these men. I understand that many men died after having received such a scourging. It was a, a very terrible thing that Jesus went through as and must have put him near death, and yet he was then forced to carry his cross to the place of the skull called Golgotha, where he would be crucified. You remember along the way, they uh, forced uh, Simon the Cyrene to come and help him to carry that cross. And when he got to the hill, they pierced his hands and his feet with the nails. They suspended him 
uh, in the air upon the cross. And Jesus committed his spirit back to God who gave it, having taken his last breath. The Jews were concerned about something. The Jews were concerned that the sun was about to set and the Sabbath day was coming on. And they wanted the bodies of those who had been crucified to be taken down before the Sabbath arrived. Ironically, they were more concerned about the Sabbath law than they were about rejecting their own Messiah. And so uh, in John, the 19th chapter, in verses 31 through 37, uh, we see how that uh, the Roman soldiers came to the, those that were crucified and broke the legs of those that were crucified with Jesus so they would die immediately and they could take their bodies down. But when they came to the body of Jesus, they saw that he was, as the scripture says, already dead. Again, remember, these were experts in death. This wasn't their first crucifixion. And they determined that Jesus was dead. And then they cast the spear into his side, and the scripture says that water and blood came forth, indicating that Jesus was, like the scripture said, already dead. Had he been living, blood would have come out of his body, but water and blood come from the body of Jesus. Jesus died there at Calvary. It's not only a matter of, of man's historical record. You can read about it in Tacitus and Josephus and others. But it's a matter of God's inspired record that we have for us today. And if you read at the end of Matthew chapter 27, you'll see that they took down the body of Jesus and they wrapped it in linen cloths. And then they placed this body in a new tomb. That is a tomb where no one had yet been buried. It was a tomb that had been cut out of rock. And so there was no way in or out of this tomb except through the mouth of the tomb. And so a large stone was placed at the mouth of the tomb. The Jews were concerned about somebody perhaps stealing the body of Jesus and claiming that he had been raised from the dead. And so they had the, the stone sealed and the tomb secured with guards. So the scourging and the crucifixion and the burial with the claws and the, the guards render the idea that Jesus somehow awakened from a deep coma to loosen himself of those burial clothes and, and move away the stone and overcome the guards and walk away in absolute absurdity. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of Jesus' death. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of the not-so-empty tomb. Because what about the suggestion of the Jews that someone might have stolen the body of Jesus? You see, when Peter and John heard that Christ had raised from the dead, they went to examine the tomb. And you remember John outran Peter, and he looked in. But when Peter got there, he went in a little, a little further. And in John chapter 20, we see that he uh, looked very closely. And indeed, the body of Jesus was not there, but something was there in the tomb. I want to read with you here from John chapter 20, verses 5 through 7, so we can notice uh, very closely what it was that Peter and John found in the tomb that day. John 20, verse 5. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now can you imagine somebody coming into the tomb of Jesus to steal his body and unwrapping the body? and then neatly folding the handkerchief that was around his head. No, if somebody's coming in to steal the body of Jesus, they're going to grab up his body and take him away immediately. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of the not-so-empty tomb. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of indisputable eyewitness testimony. Again, read the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read Paul's uh, description of those who saw Jesus after his death in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
And we see that Jesus made numerous appearances to his apostles. 1 John 1 verse 1 tells us they not only saw him and heard him, but they handled him with their hands. You remember the two on the way to Emmaus that Jesus joined and they asked him into their house when they arrived at the city and, and he was eating with them in Luke 24. Or in John chapter 21, where some of the apostles saw Jesus cooking and eating breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. And what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, how that 500 brethren, about 500, saw him at once. This dispels the idea that some have suggested these people were just hallucinating. They were just seeing things. But 500 saw the same thing at the same time. That doesn't happen unless it's real. And then there's Doubting Thomas. The first time that Jesus appeared to his apostles, Thomas wasn't there. But when the apostles told Thomas how that Jesus had appeared to them, how they saw him alive, he said I, that he wouldn't believe until he could reach his finger into the print of the nails and, and put his hand in Jesus' side. And you remember the next Sunday, Jesus appeared to the apostles again, this time Thomas among them, and he said, reach your finger into the print of the nails. Put your hand in my side, and be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. I'm so glad that Thomas made investigation, that Thomas wanted this proof, because forever he settles our doubts about the fact that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. The proof of the resurrection is the indisputable eyewitness testimony. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of the newfound courage of his disciples. Yes. Remember that night Jesus was arrested in the garden and how his disciples fled from him. And then at the arrest of Jesus, how Peter was at a distance and and uh, following along, but somebody recognized Peter as one of his followers, and Peter denied him again and again and again. And at the cross, the only apostle we read about being there was John. These apostles, having witnessed the death of Jesus, had lost their faith. And yet, it wasn't very long after that, that we see these very same men boldly, publicly proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus in the very city outside of which he was crucified, the city of Jerusalem. It would have been in the interest of the Jewish authorities, of the Roman authorities, to have spiked this story about the resurrection of Jesus. And they could have done that very simply by producing the body of Jesus. But they never did. They threatened and they punished and they put to death some of the disciples of Christ. But they could not stop them from proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. What happened that these frightened, frustrated defeated disciples would suddenly become fearless preachers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead. Remember Jesus' promise in Matthew 16, 18, before going to the cross? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Even death could not hold Jesus. Even death could not prevent him from establishing his church as we read about there in Acts chapter 2 that we've just rehearsed here this morning. Amen. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of the newfound courage of his disciples, the establishment of Christ's church. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of the conversion of the Saul of Tarsus. You remember Saul, don't you? The first Christian martyr, Stephen, stoned to death in the streets of Jerusalem. Read about it in Acts chapter 7. And Saul there consenting to his death. Saul was one who was very zealous of the law, who hated the church, 
who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And chapter 8 tells us that he made havoc of the church. And he dragged men and women out of their houses and he put them in prison. And in chapter 9 we see having been granted permission by the Jewish authorities, he was going to extend that persecution to the city of Damascus. But something happened on the way to Damascus. Because after that, this zealot of the law, this uh, persecutor of God's people becomes a powerful preacher of the resurrection of Jesus. In spite of the fact that he would suffer great loss and tremendous persecution for the rest of his life. You and I know what happened. We read about it in Acts chapter 9 when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He saw that Jesus was alive, that Jesus was well, that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8, he was seen by me also. The proof of the resurrection is the proof of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Surely this morning, having considered these things, our hearts are assured concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's in that faith that we are all able to experience the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection is the power of salvation. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, that baptism saves us. Not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, Peter was trying to explain to us that baptism is not about washing dirt off of our body. It's not about a physical cleansing. But it's about a cleansing of the soul that produces forgiveness, that removes the guilt so that we can have a clear, good conscience before God. But Peter makes it clear that the power is not in the water. It's in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're saved by baptism, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our trust. Our faith must be in the working of God, not in our own performance. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12 tells us that we're buried with Christ in baptism and we're raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same God that raised Jesus from the dead will with that same power raise us up out of the waters of baptism, having been spiritually dead, now to spiritually alive. That's the power of the resurrection, the power of salvation. The power of the resurrection is the power to live new life. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 tells us that we're buried by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Having been united together with him in the likeness of his death, We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. In our giving ourselves to the Lord in baptism, we identify with the power of the resurrection. And that power enables us to live the new life. Be the kind of people that God would have us to be. It's based upon our faith that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is well. We're trusting in his promise of Matthew 28, 20. I'll always be with you. Jesus had went to the cross, but now he'd been raised, and he promised his apostles, I'm not going to leave you anymore. I'll always be with you, even to the end of the world. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, and verse 6, so that we say, with good courage, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What shall man do unto me? It's the resurrected Christ that gives us power to live the new life. Look with me in Romans, the 8th chapter, and I want to read this passage to you, beginning in verse 31, where the Apostle Paul emphasizes the importance of the resurrected Jesus in the life of the Christian. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We know that we have one who stands before God on our behalf every day, every moment of our life. And so Paul says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is power in the resurrection to live the new life. It's that power that compels us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, the love of Christ compels us. He died for all that they who live should no longer live unto themselves, but to him who died for them and rose again. The tragedy, brethren, is that those who claim to follow Christ are still living as though he is dead. I hope that's not what they would say about us. But I know that if we've been raised together with Christ, as Paul said in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, that we are to seek those things that are above because he says Christ is our life. If you're a Christian today, if you've been raised with the Lord in baptism, then that's what your life is all about. It's not enough for us to believe that Jesus died and was raised again 20 centuries ago. It must make a practical difference in our life. As Paul went on to say in Colossians chapter 3, as he talked about our basic attitudes and our values and how we treat others and, and our conduct, all of these things are affected by the power of the resurrection. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The power of the resurrection is the power of salvation. The power of the resurrection is the power to live the new life. And having experienced that power, we can know the hope of the resurrection. The hope of the resurrection is a hope that is living, not dead. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again, unto a living hope. A living hope. When Jesus died, it seemed that all hope was gone, but the resurrection of Jesus has revived that hope forevermore. I love Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Because John was writing to those churches that were suffering severe persecution. A persecution that was only going to get worse. And John pictures for us there in that first chapter a vision of Jesus Christ in all of his glory and all of his power. And in, in verse 18, Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead and is now alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Don't be afraid, he was saying to the churches. I'm alive, I'm well. There is hope, even in death. When Jesus came on the scene of the funeral of Lazarus in John chapter 11, and Mary and Martha were weeping, you remember he said to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's the hope of the resurrection, a living hope, not a dead hope. It's the hope that we too will be raised from the dead. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. He who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up with him. Just as surely as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, so we shall be someday. Paul 
in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. We do not sorrow as those who have no hope. For we believe that if Jesus died and rose again, God will bring back with him those that are fallen asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's the hope of the resurrection, that we'll be raised. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul has a lot to say about that because this is everything. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, we have no hope. We die to live no more. Satan, sin, death wins. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have victory. And we have every reason to continue on in the Lord. Paul said this mortal will put on immortality. This corruption will put on incorruption. Death is swallowed up in victory. And thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And wherefore be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. The power of the resurrection is the power of an eternal inheritance. 1 Peter 1, 4. Incorruptible, undefiled, it fades not away. Reserved for you in heaven. That's beyond our mind. <laughs> That's beyond our world. And God in trying to give us just a glimpse of that glorious home. Can only compare it to those things that are most wonderful to us. You read about the eternal state of God's church in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. He says it's as a bride adorned for her husband. I have a little picture on my desk of my wife in her wedding gown. And she's just as beautiful to me today as she was that day she walked down the aisle. But do you husbands remember the beauty of your bride? Heaven is like that. That's the hope of the resurrection. He says it's like a great city with 12 foundations, each one made of a precious gem. The gates of that city are each one made of one gigantic perfect pearl. And you walk through the gates of that city and there is that street of gold, transparent as glass. And running down the middle of that boulevard, the river of the water of life, crystal clear, growing on both sides of the tree of life, bearing its fruit in the seasons for the healing of the nations. In the midst of that city, the throne of God, in all of his glory. He's the light. He's the glory of that place. As John said in Revelation 21 and verse 3, God himself dwells among men. And he wipes every tear. From their eyes. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. That's the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. May God help us to know Him and the power of His resurrection. Thank you for your attention and God bless you today. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love.